Mary Beth Leonard is the current U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, assuming office on December 24, 2019. She has been 33 years in the U.S. State Department. She served as economic and consular officer in Yaoundé, Cameroon, Windhoek, Namibia, and Lomé, Togo. She's also served as deputy chief mission in Bamako, Mali, and ambassador to the Republic of Mali. She served as the director for West African Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, was appointed representative of the United States of America to the African Union by former President Barack Obama, and was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria on August 1, 2019, presented her credentials to President Muhammadu Buhari on December 24, 2019. And in my interview with her, she talks about her perception of the country and her work in the country during the COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria-U.S. relations and immigration under the new U.S. administration of President Joe Biden. Ambassador Leonard, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's a pleasure having you here. And I know, I understand you've been in the country for more than six months now. Um, even though many Nigerians haven't seen you, you know, really out there, mm -hmm. but you have been around, you have gone around the country as much as you can, mm -hmm. uh, despite the restrictions and so on. How are you finding your stay so far in Nigeria? I love Nigeria. I, I think it's a fabulous place. You know, if you're Mary Beth Leonard and you've done your entire diplomatic career in Africa, um, the idea that by the third time you get to be an ambassador, you get to come to Nigeria, the, the really the really big um, giant on the continent, is just so exciting. You know, you just can't overstate how important Nigeria is in terms of the size of its economy and its population and its dynamism and its, its, its regional role. Um, I wish by now I had seen more of Nigeria instead of the walls inside my house, you mean, however charming those walls might be. <laughs> True. So I think in the, in the coming months we'll be able to do, I'm hope, looking forward to being able to travel more across the country. So far I've been to Lagos a few times um, and uh, before the pandemic really broke out um, I was in Kaduna. I think if it had not been pandemic times, I probably went, would have been to 10 states in Nigeria by now. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to getting out and, um, and uh, meeting people, seeing, uh, seeing different places. But interestingly enough, your appointment, as you said, came during the mm -hmm. time of the pandemic. So how would you then describe you know, the information sharing mm -hmm. between uh, Nigeria and the US, knowing how rapidly mm -hmm. this coronavirus is changing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have different mutations, you mm -hmm. know, of the virus now and, very, and various variants of the virus. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see Nigeria and the U.S. working, you know, side by side, trying to help people understand what's going on? Well, you used the right words. Um, the Nigeria and the United States have been working side by side on COVID-19 from the very early parts, the very early days of this pandemic. And that was actually based on an incredibly long and robust um, uh, cooperation and health between the United States and Nigeria. We are um, the leading provider of uh, medical care uh, for, for HIV AIDS patients under the PEPFAR program. Uh, we were really stuck into the uh, polio vaccinations. Uh, we have long been a force for health in Nigeria. And many of those same investments we were able to help Nigeria build on in terms of uh, the logistics of moving samples from place to place, um, uh, building on the backbone of the laboratories that we had helped establish with, uh, with the pre President's Program for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. In fact, there were probably 62 or 63 people from uh, my embassy, people who work for USAID, for the Centers for Disease Control, and for the Walter Reed Army Institute for Research, who were working alongside their colleagues in the Ministry of Health at the Presidential Task Force in, um, uh, in, the, in, uh, in various laboratories to think about how to address um, the testing aspect of the pandemic as we were in that phase. And now that we're moving towards the vaccination phase, with the happy arrival of vaccines into uh, Nigeria for the first time, uh, we'll be looking at the logistics and, and constraints and opportunities and how it is that you make um, the vaccine available. So we've spent so far um, some $72 million on that effort. Um, I would say that the biggest news on U.S. efforts against COVID-19 is the new Biden administration's emphasis on re-entering the multilateral arena to be really a leader and a catalyst um, in, global, in global health. Certainly, we were very active through all the um, activities that I described to you mm -hmm. over the first 14 months. The difference now is, I think, the um, the renewed commitment to multilateralism, you saw that on the first or the second day of his administration, um, President Biden had the United States rejoin the World Health Organization. 
And we have committed not only to the logistics of the response, but to contributing quite a large sum of money to making sure that vaccines can make it to every corner of the world. Yeah, and speaking of vaccines, mm -hmm. we've heard some of the world leaders talk about um, developed countries contributing to mm -hmm. vaccines in poorer countries, and they're saying that many developed countries acquired more vaccines that they mm -hmm. needed, and the, the rest of it should be mm -hmm. given to poorer countries. Does the U.S. think so? Yeah, so I think the, the, question, the question is, while there may be individual countries that have gotten more vaccine than they currently need, the larger story is of the need for the vaccine um, uh, outstripping the supply that is coming online. Certainly there are new vaccines being discovered and that is increasing the availability. The question is, as I said before, for the Biden administration is how do you get that vaccine to every corner of the earth that needs it? One of the answers to that is uh, the United States' $4 billion contribution to COVAX, the Global, um, the global Alliance for Vaccine Initiatives, uh, mechanism for distributing vaccine around the world. So what we've done with that $4 billion that was appropriated, or what we are doing with that $4 billion that was appropriated by the U.S. Congress in um, um, uh, December, is to decide to give $2 billion of that immediately, and then um, hold off uh, additional tranches of it until we see other partners step up with more uh, financial resources to support the amount of money that it's going to take to get uh, vaccine everywhere. What can Nigeria expect under the Biden administration? So I'm, I hope that you noticed that one of the first um, speeches that President Biden made in early in his administration was to the African Union Summit in February, where he talked about a renewed spirit of partnership and engagement. Um, and I think it, and the idea is looking towards um, the strengths and the opportunities and the optimism um, in order to uh, engage in, in really robust partnerships. You've seen a very early recommitment to multilateralism, not only through uh, rejoining the WHO, but through U.S. support um, for the Nigerian candidate for the for the World yeah. Trade Organization, um, and I think that this is an administration that doesn't necessarily think that multilateral institutions are perfect, um, but believe and indeed some of them are not, um, but believes that it's important to be a part of that conversation and a part of those institutions in order to bring about those reforms to the the goals that we all have, which is for a safe, secure prosperous, healthy world. So I think that's a lot of what you can expect to see in the, in, the, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. And I think that makes for a really good moment for Nigeria too. When you look at, you think about how many uh, prominent Nigerians are in important positions in international organizations, right? The Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, the head of the, the World Trade Organization, uh, the AU's permanent representative uh, in New York who sort of works to marshal um, Africa voices there um, is also a Nigerian. Nigerian, as is the president of the African Development Bank. And who am I missing? I am missing. There have also been some Nigerian, uh, people of Nigerian descent in the Biden administration. And in the Deputy Secretary for the Treasury. Um, you know, they're, they're everywhere. So I think at a moment where the United States is really looking towards uh, a renewed multilateralism, the fact that there are so many prominent Nigerians in these roles um, is, is really important. Ah, I know. I cannot believe that the one I forgot. Oh my goodness, I was the ambassador to the African Union. This man was my neighbor in Addis Ababa, is the new um, political and peace and security affairs commissioner at the African Union. So you've got a really formidable um, array of talent in key um, security and, and uh, economic uh, international institutions mm -hmm. to help be a partner with the United States as it goes towards that new uh, spirit of multilateralism. Well, apart from the coronavirus, we saw, well, we have seen the President Joe Biden talk a lot about immigration. He signed mm -hmm. a few executive orders on the first day of uh, his administration, and immigration is really important mm -hmm. uh, to Nigeria, considering the Trump administration also focused on immigration. Mm -hmm. We know how important that is to mm -hmm. America. Where is Nigeria then mm -hmm. in America's foreign policy? policy on immigration. On immigration. Well, you're correct that the, the new president made a couple of um, decisions on immigration uh, on, in the very first days, notably to reverse uh, bans on um, certain kinds of immigration, among which Nigeria had, had, had fallen um, on the immigrant visa front. Mm -hmm. So uh, that has been reversed, and um, Nigerians are again eligible for all categories of immigrant visas. But it's very important for Nigeria, the most significant uh, Nigerian diaspora population in the world world is in the United States. They are also among the, the best educated immigrants in the United States. Um, it's a really uh, powerful and significant community. So we're very glad uh, to see you know, uh, uh, that, that, that reversal, as I, I suppose I really hope that Nigeria is too. The premise of the, the visa bans or that, that whole exercise in the beginning was about um, 
asking Nigeria to make certain reforms in information sharing and identity management. Mm -hmm. And I really have to salute the efforts of the, of the Nigerian government, which were Herculean, in um, uh, making it easier to convey um, information to places like Interpol and being ever better able to have um, faith in the reliability of the underlying data. The, Nigeria did a fabulous job in answering that, and their efforts uh, make all of us safer. And I really have to salute their efforts. I say thank you on behalf of the mm -hmm. government. Um, moving on, of course, you mentioned visa uh, visas for Nigerians and visa appointments have been quite hard mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. by thanks to the pandemic. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and you know, as, as the world opens up, more people want to travel. Exactly. A lot of people are thinking of going to the United States mm -hmm. again. So where where's the uh, commission, where's the um, um, uh, embassy on visa appointments because there's a huge backlog. Yeah, and it's a, it's a frightening backlog in the sense that now we have to figure out how to address it. And, you know, the problem is is that while, you know, we're the, we have progress in, the, in, the, in the, our understanding how to manage the pandemic, part of the equation there, of course, is limiting physical contact. Uh, so the challenge for us is not only how to catch up on the you know, uh, visitors' visas and the immigrant visas that we were unable to do during a lot of the shutdown period, uh, but also how to figure out the safest way to move as many people as we possibly can through the, uh, the, 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 the consular process, whether it be at the consulate here in Lagos or at the embassy in Abuja. The brutal fact of the matter is that it will probably be hard for a little while to, to fit all that in, um, you know, given the constraints and the fact that we need to keep both our applicants and us healthy. Uh, but the, uh, so far, you know, we're um, uh, working on immigrant visas. We're also doing student visas, which is hugely important. Nigeria sends more students to the United States than any other country in Africa. Nearly 14,000 study there. So we're doing student visa appointments, we're doing exchange visitors, and a limited number of uh, business and tourist visas. There is a, a mechanism on our website where if you have an emergency need to travel, you can signal that so that we can try to get people in. The idea is to certainly plan very far in advance and understand that with all the goodwill in the world and everything that we're doing to try to figure out how to move as many people as we can through the process safely, there will in the short term uh, you know, be some, some, some limits on the numbers of people that we can accommodate. Just a little bit more on immigration. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. president also, you know, signed um, a, an executive order, I think, concerning immigration still. And mm -hmm. I think this had to do with um, people coming into the country before January 1st, 2021. The process to citizenship, mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, he shortened the period of time, I think, from seven to five years. But mm -hmm. the condition was that you had to have been in the country before mm -hmm. January 1st, 2021. Mm -hmm. How will that affect Nigerians who are already in the process mm -hmm. of getting their citizenship or those who want to go about mm -hmm. it? Um, there is a commitment in the Biden administration to realize that immigration is a source of strength um, and that, uh, that, that you will see a number of policies being revealed um, over the coming days and weeks and months in order to facilitate that. Again, you know, you don't get the, the most significant diaspora in the world without there being um, a, a, a wonderful population to, to, to take up on that. Uh, the United States recently announced a foreign language teaching assistant mm -hmm. program. Many Nigerians were excited about that because mm -hmm. to them this is their ticket to the United States. But explain again to the people what this is about. So what this is about is a nine-month training course in the, in the United States uh, for uh, Yoruba and uh, Hausa speakers to learn to be teachers of a foreign language. Um, this is something that is the, the choice of the languages and the, uh, the, the, the will to have this sort of program uh, stems from requests by U.S. universities who are looking for this talent and find it not readily available. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if you look on the embassy's website, you can find out all about this and other exchange programs that we have available, including Fulbrights and um, uh, Young African Leaders. Uh, but I think it's a really exciting opportunity. So it's a way to get more people prepared uh, to answer that demand in the United States. Um, talk to us about the U.S. Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, what examples of the kinds of projects the yes. Ambassador's Fund will be mm -hmm. Uh, supporting. 
The Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation is this fabulous program where we're able to give small grants that bring together um, host country participants and U.S. institutions to preserve um, some cool cultural thing, uh, historic cultural thing in your country. So we have, for example, in 2020, we gave a $400,000 grant, largest ever grant under that program in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's huge. To preserve 14th century uh, earthworks, um, earthen works. Uh, we've done uh, previous grants to do preserve uh, rock art, um, it, it's just really fabulous. And it's a great thing as an American diplomat to sort of um, go and learn about your country and find something that you think is engaging and, and, and just so worthy of preservation but needs some resources and perhaps a, a, a link uh, with a, a, the ability to create a linkage with someone in the United States who has a similar interest. Uh, 14 months in, in Nigeria, you <laughs> must have picked up either a few phrases or a few favorites when it comes to food. One, one of my favorites is no shaking, no, no wahala. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, and in food, um, uh, of course, you know, I, I've been in West Africa for a very, very long time, and so jollof rice is, 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 is great fun. And also, um, even among American ambassadors in the region is a, is a subject of competition, you know, who's got, who's got the best one. <laughs> No and, contest. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, and I have a real uh, a real fondness for really spicy soup, really spicy foods. Oh. So I'm a big pepper soup fan. Right. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Ambassador Lena. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy your stay in Nigeria. Thank you.